All people are when you obey God's word of that was built by slaves, reality. and I watch my daughters. There is nobody that respects women more than I do. This love crisis, love that. This. I was recently on a trip with my family in Palm Springs and decided to take a little walk in the afternoon. On my way, the road I was walking down was suddenly closed down. There was police tape and it looked like nobody was supposed to go back there, but as it was not really a heavy foot traffic area, nobody had bothered to tape off the sidewalk. So, you know, I don't know, maybe I wasn't supposed to go down there. But I decided to proceed down the sidewalk on my walk anyway. And on the way, I came across, wouldn't you know it, a dead body on the road. It had been covered up with a sheet because, well, let's be honest, we don't like seeing dead bodies. Why do you think that is? I mean, we see living, breathing, moving bodies all of the time. And we like looking at those. But if the body stops functioning, we are suddenly creeped out, extremely averse to even seeing it. Not only do we cover up our dead bodies with sheets until they can be properly cleaned and primped, manicured, makeuped, and prepared for our final goodbyes at their funerals, we actually go to the length of bringing in law enforcement to tape off entire streets so that nobody dares to see some body who can no longer be thought of as a somebody. Why is it that we are so averse to death, so much so that we don't even want to see its presence in our midst? I live in Los Angeles, California with my wife, Lisa, and my two daughters, and recently we had a big ant problem at our house and ended up needing to call the exterminator. And as a family of hippie snowflake Angelinos, this was not a pleasant decision for us to make. All of us were really sad about needing to kill thousands of little life forms which is something, you know, I grew up in Wisconsin and would have laughed at what we've become. But we didn't know what else to do. We were being overrun by ants. We had to call the exterminator. And so we all just kind of were kind of bummed about this. These poor little ants just trying to live and be like we are, trying to live in their own home, which just happened to be in our home. But just as we decided to do every time we eat, we decided to place our own life above that of other life and call the exterminator for the ants to be killed. Streets are rough. So the exterminator came on his van and said, I am become death, destroyer of worlds. Not really, but that would have been amazing. But he sprayed around the property and of course, for the next several days, we begin to find countless corpses of tiny little innocent ants lying around our house. And it was sad, but honestly, you know, it wasn't that sad. It's not like we went into the five stages of grief or anything. I mean, I don't know if you've realized this, but there is a certain level of grief that you're allowed to have in human society for ants before they put you away. Think about it. At a certain point, if it became so sad for us that we spent all of our money on thousands of ant funerals and trying to book up grave slots all through the Los Angeles area, somebody eventually would be like, you got, you guys need some, uh, you need some professional help because that's not acceptable to care that much about ants corpses. So we kept our compassion and empathy for ants to maybe a, a more extreme than normal, but certainly within the realms of, social acceptability levels. I just think it's worth pointing out that we as a society have rules and taboos, even if they're not written. We all know what they are for what we can and should do with dead bodies of every kind. 
If you come across the dead body of an insect, spider, or pest, for instance, nothing respectful need to be done with the body. We all know that. You can feel free to throw it outside, vacuum it up, or just wipe it up with a paper towel and throw it in the trash can. We don't think that matters. Of course, there's a caveat to that, because the rules would change if the corpse of the insect, spider, or pest has become a household pet. You know, in the case of your beloved tarantula, Goliath, for instance, the casual paper towel toss into the trash sort of disposal may no longer be satisfactory for many pet owners, and such a send-off might seem a bit heartless. One might prefer to bury Goliath in the yard or at least lower his body gently into the trash can, perhaps with a slight pregnant pause before shutting the lid. Goldfish? You can do almost anything you'd like with the corpse of a goldfish, even flushing him or her down the toilet. But even with Herb the Goldfish, there are some rules. No garbage disposals, for instance. It seems to me that the metric that we use for what's appropriate to do with the body of a dead life form is how attached we are and have been to that life form. So by the time we make it all the way up to human bodies, our rules, of course, get a lot more stringent. My friend Science Mike, who many of you know from the Liturgist podcast, my other podcast that I host, and I once had a conversation about what we would like our, to happen to our bodies after we die, and his, uh, his dream that he shared with me was to have his naked corpse orbit the Earth, be blasted off into space. Because apparently... If your naked corpse gets blasted off into to orbit, it could last for a long time. Millions, maybe even billions of years. You could just see this uh, portly white gentleman floating without clothing past your spaceship. I mean, that's pretty, <laughs> I thought that was a pretty great idea. But, you know, not all of us. That's not the dream. That's not the American dream, necessarily. This is the kind of question I like to ask my sister, actually. Hold on. Hello? Lissa, do you think, would you call it your dream to, when you're dead, launch your naked corpse into orbit around the planet for time immemorial? Well, okay, here's the thing. It depends on how I die and how old I am. If I'm an old woman, yes, 100%. I want my saggy boobs floating in in orbit. I think it would be a beautiful gesture. But you don't want it now. No, no. Why? Especially, I don't know if it's like a woman thing, but like there have been stages in my life where I'm like, this is my body, all right. And then like you have a kid and you're like, this is a new body, okay. And then I had my second kid and I'm like, this is another body. Okay, but I don't know if I want this one out there. You know what I mean? So I don't know if this is the one. That's just you have some sort of shame about that body, or some sort of attachment to it. What's the, what's the story? I feel like it's almost like an attachment to like it's almost like I don't know. I feel like maybe it's like my kid's body right now, and I'm like, oh, maybe it's because I'm nursing. Where I'm like, ooh, I feel weird about that. Does that make sense? I suppose. What, what have like you... an old body? Like then it's like then it's. I feel like it would be like it's mine, and like I lived all my days in it, and I had all my kids with it, and it changed, and it got old, and it withered, and I think that's something really beautiful, and then I wouldn't mind. All right, I don't know that multiple body per person thing is a little out there. I think I'm going to need to make one more call here, to clarify something. Hello? Hey, Mom. Hi, honey. How are you doing? Great. Just started a new podcast, and I asked uh, Lissa um, a question, 
and I was going to ask you the same. Oh do, my you, God. do you want to do it or I'm not? On the public eye. And when is this? Right now, I can just ask you the question and record you on my phone. No, you like this. <laughs> That's what you like. <laughs> hey, we could be outer space then. Well, that's that's what my question is. Mars is, people. We're Mars people. Well, that's what I, my question was for you is if, if when you die, you would have... Well, let me call you back. What? When you die, what? You would, how, would it... Yeah. What, what, what would, would you have a problem with you being launched? cookies until eternity? What about if you could be launched into space, if your body could be launched into space? Please, I'm not doing that. If your body could be launched into space... To orbit the Earth for billions of years. Yeah. You're yeah. just naked corpse. Would you do it? No, I'm not going naked. What about if you well, were clothed? I guess you'll be a smoothie by then. Come again? You'll be a smoothie. You won't have anything. Remember? Just smooth. What do you mean? Wait, let me call you back on Dad's phone. Okay. I can't hear I'll, you. I'll call, I'll call you back. I think I got what I needed. I'm not exactly sure what she means by smoothie. I think she means that your genitals will have rubbed off by then. I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. But I do find it fascinating that both her and my sister are not okay with their present bodies being launched into outer space to orbit the world for billions of years nude. But they are okay with a body that is not this present one being launched. Whether it's the old body for Lissa or whatever the hell the smoothie body is in my mother's mind. It seems to me that this supports my hypothesis that our rules for the appropriate disposal of corpses are directly tied to our attachment to the story of the particular corpses. If it's a pest, we don't care. If it's a pet, we care a little. If it's a human, we don't particularly care about. We do still want them to have some sort of basic, respectable burial or cremation, usually. But if it is a human that all of us know or care about, you know, like the Queen of England, then we're going to want cathedrals and guns and probably even a few horses involved. I'm obviously being playful and irreverent about an issue that can be very sensitive and painful. But I'm doing it for a reason. There's this verse in the Bible that says, Death, where is your sting? And that's not a feeling that most of us can relate to. Most of us view death as the worst possible of stings. We fear it. We hide from it. We lose faith, hope, and love because of it. But what if it doesn't have to be that way? Let's go talk to my weird friend Mason about it. Death. Yeah, so death. People really, really feel strongly about death. You know? Yeah, I would say that's an accurate statement. It's like the main thing that people have been freaking out about forever. We really like each other. We really like seeing the same face, the same body, the same patterns. It creates safety, a feeling of safety for us, feeling of belonging for us. So when the patterns go away or they, they change, stop having their hearts beat and talking to us, we really... We feel sad, and then we, I, we're afraid it's going to happen when it happens to us. I disagree that, like, when that actually happens, we don't feel sad because we, <laughs> we stop existing. For oh, that I'm moment, saying at least we transcend when our when our loved ones when it happens, right? But I mean, when we see it happen, we feel sad. You're right. Yeah, I mean, but basically, that's just loss, and loss is just attachment, uh, fundamentally, uh, because with no attachment, there is no feeling of loss. Um, so, basically, the fear of death, the fear of others dying, uh, is the fear of not having what you have. Okay. So, that, like most things Mason says, sounds a bit harsh. But all he is really saying is what we talked about last week, that noble truth of Buddhism, that our suffering is a result of our clinging to our desires. Sometimes we hear that, 
and misunderstand or misapply it. We see it as an attack on our desires. Like, if we were really good people, we wouldn't be attached or have desires or something. But that's not what the Buddha's teaching meant. The framework of a universal and divinely appointed moral code of some kind does not really apply in Buddhism like it does in Judeo-Christendom. So nobody is saying that you shouldn't be attached. There's simply the recognition that our attachments come with suffering. That's just how it goes. It's interesting that at all times, it seems like most people are both very dissatisfied with what's going on right now, and yet incredibly attached to what's going on right now, right? Mm -hmm. So at the same time, everyone desperately wants change and desperately fears change. Yeah, weird. Um, so, I mean, that whole existential dilemma, um, which, you know, has been called many different names in many different philosophies. Um, what are some of those names? Uh, I think it's basically dukkha in Sanskrit, um, which is just suffering or dissatisfaction with what's going on. Um, but like the existentialists, what they call it, like dread or like something like that, existential dread. I think that's what they call it. Like our big existential home run in the Western culture for all white people forever is Rene Descartes' Cogito Ergo Sum, I think, therefore I am. We're like, nailed it. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Existentialism solved. Uh, we are thinkers. That's it. The problem here is not even so much the formulation or like the statement itself. It's that he never stops to tell you what I means. He, mm. If you read the document, like yeah. he says, I think, therefore I am. I am a thinking thing. I am that which thinks, but like, what is this I? Who is this subject that is taking on all these qualities and that we're comparing to God? He compares himself to God as though they're different things immediately without even exploring the nature of either. Yeah, well, when, like thinking is happening seems like a better... Exactly, yeah, thinking is happening. Foundational there is thought. thinking. Fundamentally, I can tell. This seems to be... I would like to call what's happening thinking. <laughs> yeah, that's basically all he meant. <laughs> That's basically all he meant. All right. Remember what my sister Lissa said about her old bodies? And then I had my second kid and I'm like, this is another body. Okay. And of course. Well, so, I guess she'll be a smoothie by then. What's implied in both of those conversations is that there is a somebody that lasts between the changes of the body. But who exactly is this I that we think exists through all of the changes. Think about your own body for a moment. That body that you're experiencing right now as you started as a tiny fertilized egg. Was that single cell, that little nondescript sack of proteins, you? If not, when did that cell turn into you? When you were that little gummy bear shaped thing in your mom's womb? Or was it when you finally grew the last major structures of your nervous system? Or was it when you were born? Was that little baby's body really you? Or was it your eight-year-old body? Is that when it was you? Or your 14-year-old body or your 40-year-old body? One of the strange things about seeing a dead body, and maybe why we cover them up, is because... It creates this strange sensation, this feeling that while the body is still there, the person is not. You know, you go to a funeral and you might hear somebody say, it was Ruth's body, but Ruth was gone. But who or what was Ruth exactly? Up until the point of death, most of us thought the Ruth was that body that would come around now and again, saying her name was Ruth. But here is that same body, but it's not Ruth anymore. How can that be? Is it not the actual body that is Ruth? I mean, because there in the casket, the body's still all there. Brain, heart, lungs, fingernails, the whole thing. So why isn't it Ruth anymore? Is it because the body isn't functioning? And if that's the case, does that mean that Ruth is nothing more than the body's processes? Is Ruth digestion and circulation and thinking and breathing? Well, no, 
Because if any of those systems or processes change, you know, if she becomes unable to digest properly or had a heart transplant or some of her ways of thinking change, or she had a machine do her breathing for her, she would still be Ruth, right? I mean, you wouldn't say to someone who had a stroke and lost some of their brain's functionality that it wasn't the person anymore, even if it affected their memory, their personality, their intellectual capacity. You wouldn't just say, well, Ruth is gone now, but this body she used to inhabit is here, so what shall we name her? As long as this body lives, we still think of her as Ruth. But when the body dies, we think that Ruth is no longer there. But if Ruth is not the body itself, and if Ruth is not the functions of the body itself that occur while the body is living, what the hell is Ruth? Some sort of supernatural, invisible soul, ghost or spirit? Even if there is such a thing as an immaterial soul that can somehow interface and inhabit a living physical human body, how much ruthness could really be thought of as being the result of that soul as opposed to the body mind personality etc i mean think about it a floating bit of what when we're talking about this soul this ghost this spirit inside what is it is it energy can it move by what mechanism can it move if if it's not some sort of body can it think without a brain? Does it hold and does it store memories? Does it have a personality still? Where is that stuff stored? Is, is she still a she? In other words, does she have a vulva? Does she identify as a gender, as a sex, as a human? Without a voice and a temperament and a brain and all the rest of the stuff that comes with a body... How could some soul, some disembodied immaterial soul, be reasonably thought of as a Ruth still? Does that sound that came from her parents? Ruth? <laughs> Speaking a certain language with a certain biological type of sound-making mechanism? Like, Ruth is something that you can say with a human mouth, and larynx, lips, and teeth, and cheeks, and lungs. Ruth. Does that name, does that idea still apply without a body? And what is it that's keeping this soul around and together? Is it really ontologically separate from the rest of reality? Does that one soul have a completely different source and context than the rest of reality, seen or unseen? Now listen, I really have no idea if immaterial souls are some things that exist or not. There's a lot of people smarter than me that think both ways on the subject. But the way I see it, even if they do, even if there are ghosts and souls and some part of what I am that leaves when I die, it seems more likely to me that how we think of those things would be far more rooted in the ego stories produced by these biological organisms than by a clear, direct knowledge. After all, if we had that direct knowledge about the intricacies of immaterial souls, we'd all agree with each other about what it is, right? I mean, we're not having huge debates about whether most human beings have eyeballs or not. But all we have to go on when we're talking about souls is our hunches and our stories, our imagination. And that's not to say that those things aren't valid or important, but I think it's reasonable to notice the extent to which egos can go, to feel like real and separate entities, the subject of experience, and how their primary aim is survival. I mean, what better way to feel better about the ego surviving than to imagine my small and separate sense of self as existing beyond the death of my body. Whether or not immaterial souls exist, the truth is that what we think of as Ruth 
is not any of these things. Ruth is not that body in the casket, nor was it any body leading up to the body in the casket. Ruth is not the functions of that body or any of those bodies. Ruth is not the soul that may or may not have temporarily inhabited that body. Ruth is, well, a story. That's how my sister can think of one version of her organism's form as being more her, and therefore more embarrassing to launch into space naked, or that's why my mother can think that if she becomes a smoothie, then it's not that big of a deal, because that doesn't impact the story of Gail Gunger in the same way. Who you think you are is a story. You're sort of like Texas. If you go to the border of Oklahoma and Texas and look at the ground right there at the state line, what do you see? Here's some dirt, and here's some dirt. And this dirt is called Oklahoma, and this dirt is called Texas. So what happens if you take, say, a leaf from the dirt in Oklahoma and put it right on the state line? Is that leaf now half Oklahoma and half Texas? If you push it over to the Texas side, is it now Texas? Is that really accurate? Could you pick up that leaf now and say... Here is Texas. You can do this same thought experiment with pretty much anything. How much of something is necessary to take away before that something is not that something anymore? If you take a bite of an apple, does the apple in your hand remain an apple? Or is it now just a fragment of apple? What if the bite is really big? What if you bit half of that apple? Is the half in your mouth the apple, or is the one in your hand the apple, or is it just pieces of an apple now? Where is that line when an apple becomes not an apple? You see what I mean? What exactly makes up one thing and separates it from another, an apple from an apple core to a decomposing bit of compost? There's no firm lines between any of that. There's no firm lines between a me and my fingernail and a fingernail clipping and a dead corpse. It all just sort of goes together. And when I stop with my mind, the movement and constant flux of change that is everything to think of it as a something, I'm basically just taking a snapshot of swirling energy and thinking of it as a something. The truth is that Texas and Oklahoma and you None of these things are real things. They're just stories that we tell about all of the swirling energy that is the one thing, the all, the universe. If we all suddenly believed that the borders of Texas were somewhere else, or, you know, Texas was smaller, it would be. If we believed that Texas, if we believed, if everybody believed that Texas was actually named Ted Cruz as an alien colony, it would be. Like, right now. People would be confused at all, you know, all the signs that say Texas on them. But they'd promptly fix them to say, welcome to Ted Cruz as an alien colony. The stars at night are big and bright. Everybody go clap, 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 deep in the heart of Ted Cruz is an alien colony. This may be sacrilege for those of you in Texas. I'm sorry for that if it is. But the truth is that all of our sacred cows like Ted Cruz's and Texas's and me's are just stories. Whoever you think you are, if you believed a different story, you would be a different someone. That's why people fear death, because... You try and imagine it and you can't. But what is this? Like, what would it be to not exist? I can't, like, if I'm a thinking thing, how could mm-hmm. I go on? Um, and that's why it brings such tension is because we're so attached to this whatever limited aspect of yourself you consider to be the subject of the universe. 
I don't think people real a lot of people realize how that sense of self is rising moment to moment based on the feelings in your body and the the memories that you're accessing. So like you're in a room, we're standing in a bedroom right now that looks like someone was murdered in here. <laughs> but that I have these stories of, that based on my memories and my experiences have been programmed into my that this is a bed that there's all these like pendants on the wall of these sports teams and all this stuff has these stories based in my memory and what's been programmed into my unconscious mind and but all that's being accessed right now and that sense of self is this story that we've inherited from our culture from our i guess our biology as well but it's moment to moment thinking the guy that learned about the cardinals this team on the wall the body that first heard about that and then has stored this memory of what that is and that and it's created this story that I am the same guy now that saw that it's this constantly told story from moment to moment i think it's really apt that you're using the word story um cuz i think that's what all this is fundamentally it's a story and you have to ask who's perceiving the story um, mm-hmm. constantly i think we should ask ourselves that who's listening like whenever something occurs in your mind and you have a thought who is it that heard that thought <laughs> who is it that reflected on that thought? Well, most people, they, it it doesn't seem complicated. They just say me. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's this idea of me. But that's the thing. It's, it's the idea of me. Yeah. So death... So death... Is more of the same, right? I mean, well, so my central contention is that death does not exist. Um, death is a myth. Yeah. Um, because death implies a dissolution of the subject or an end to reality. Yeah. And that just doesn't exist. Um, it's pretty obvious from like a physical standpoint. We understand, most people understand the conservation of energy, the conservation of momentum. Uh, the universe is this, always has been. This does a lot of stuff. It takes a lot of different forms in a lot of different places at times. But it, it, it conserves itself. There is only the same spirit flowing. So, uh, yeah, like I was just telling you about a, a quote earlier from Buddhist, who I'm not going to try and remember his name. Um, but he basically said, like, you look at a cloud and you say, there's a cloud. And then later when it rains, you say, there's no cloud, but that's ridiculous because the cloud is in the rain. Um, and I mean, bodies decomposed, every, every atom of me will continue to exist forever. Even if the atoms break, the energy will continue to exist forever. Uh, the constituent parts of my body now will flow into the universe um, and my mind, my spirit is none other than that. Everything manifests from the same one and that is conserved physically, you know, and really it is conserved. Do you have like a, a cos a cosmological eschatology as far as like it, if the universe turns into a, if it just spreads out until it's just null, basically, if it does a big crunch again, re is reborn. Do you like, is there anything to the... Hindu, is it kalpas? Is that what they call them? Um, like the period of however uh, many billion yugas. years? Yugas. They're called yugas. Yugas? Yeah. How many billion? I forget how many billions of years. They're really long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, do you have any thoughts or about any of that? Um, yeah, so I think all of those are stories. Uh, you <clears throat> yeah. told me a bunch of stories there. Yeah. And all those stories unfold all the time. Because time and space are infinite. Everything happens all the time. Everything is perfectly common. And... There's no such thing as permanence because everything is just a momentary, including a total a, dissolution of all existence. Yeah, like that could happen, and it would be basically meaningful, meaningless in the next instant in which someone considered it, because then we'd be somewhere else doing something else. It's the old, old koan: if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make sound? Hmm. If there's no universe <laughs> and there's no one around to perceive it, then why the hell are we talking about it? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that, sure that happens all the time. That's really the essence of what's happening right now. <laughs> is that there is no universe and no one to perceive it. So here we are. <laughs> Good. Cool. Admittedly, death does not exist. Is not helpful for a lot of people where they're at 
especially if they're grieving, mourning. But it is possible for death to lose its sting, for us not to be afraid of death, not to hide from death, but to see that it is a part of life, to see that what I tend to think and feel that I am, that small sense of separateness, dies every moment because nothing is permanent. So many of us suffer so much because we cling to stories wanting to make the world permanent, wanting to make this something other than it is. It's not wrong to be attached to people or to our own lives in fact, it's part of the joy and fullness of life, oftentimes. But in the end, death and life go together in the dream, like up and down, left and right, yin and yang. It's all just part of the one movement that is the true you. There's a story about when Ramana Maharshi was dying. And his devotees were so full of grief. And his response to them was, You say I am going away, but where can I go? I don't think he was being facetious or silly. I don't think he was just dealing with abstraction and philosophy. He simply wasn't identified with his ego or his body. He saw that he was the same non-dual isness as you and I and the trees and the mountains and the galaxies are. There is only one. It's only one of us. So where could it go? How could I, the I am, die if it was never born? This is and that's it there's a buddhist analogy that plainly lays out the illusion of death think of a fist and what is a fist really i mean it's a function of the hand right it's a flexing of muscles it's a shape of bones and tendons and tissues so what happens to a fist when the hand opens. That, beloved, is death. The changing of form that is this. Death is simply the relaxing of muscles, the unclenching of tendons. But to lose the fist is not the same thing as losing the hand, the true self, the infinite, all that can never be born and can never die, that is you, that is this. And here we are again, this breath, this heartbeat, this moment, all aspects, all movement and music within the one. So breathe free, beloved, for this is all there is.